I'm talking about the implications from Zechariah chapter 2. He says, I will be a wall of fire around you. And then God says to Zechariah the prophet, I will be the glory within her. I, what does that mean? When God says to the church, I will be the glory within. Well, one of its implications is the incarnation. The incarnation is when the word became flesh and dwelled among us. So you, I want you to picture this in your head as we start this. We have seen God in Jesus, physically. The Bible now tells the world that they will see Jesus in the church. So the only way that mankind could ever get an idea what God is like was when Jesus came in the flesh. And in those days, they saw him. Today, the only way the world will see the Father in the Son is by looking at you, by looking at the church. It is the obligation placed upon the church that we become, in a sense, the likeness of Christ. And so there's an, there's an, there's an implication to the incarnation, the fact that we claim Jesus is among us. And I've done three implications already. Here's implication number four, and you can tell, seeing as it's nine minutes to nine, you can tell this is going to be a short sermon. Implication number four of the incarnation of Jesus is Jesus came to establish fellowship between God and man. Jesus came to establish fellowship between God and man. This is arguably one of the most difficult sermons to preach on the basis that some people have built in reservations to the possibility of experiencing God. Some of you may come from a very traditional church background which tells you that God is simply received by faith. You just believe by faith Jesus dwells within you and there's no real change in your life, which flies in the face of the entire New Testament. Because when people had been with Jesus, the Bible says it was evident these men had been with Jesus. There was change. Our boast to the world is that Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, takes residence in a believer. The Bible uses this language. The power that raised Christ from the dead dwells within us. Now, these are either words or their experience. And I want to just try in a few minutes to begin to look at some of the implications of what happens, how Jesus makes fellowship with God possible. With the understanding that every person in this room can experience the fullness of abundant life. Jesus said the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the devil's works and that you may have life and have it to the full. You can and should live in a broken, messed up world as a victorious child of God. You should be in this world while not being of this world. There should be the evidence of a transformation, the evidence of the fact that God, unseen, has touched your life in such a way that every aspect of you is busy changing. Here's the catch. It involves from your side a leaning into Him, an experiencing of Him, where you have to decide, I'm going to learn what it means to open myself up for God to touch me. God will not do it without your permission. The text I want to use is that amazing passage in 1 John chapter 1. If you want to turn there, if you didn't bring your Bible, just look at the screen. I'm reading from the ESV version of the Bible. 1 John chapter 1. <clears throat> John was a disciple of Jesus. He had walked with Jesus very, very closely. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, the books of 1, 2, 3 John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. Our closest idea of what happens in the end comes from this guy. And he writes these, these three little booklets, tiny little books, which will literally transform your life if you want to understand true discipleship. And he says, that which was from the beginning. 
You can see he's leaning into the book of Genesis and the book of John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. Hyphen. He just goes on to another track quickly. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. Hyphen. Goes back onto the theme he was trying to talk about concerning the word of life. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things that our joy may be complete. I literally could preach on this till the end of the year and not repeat myself. There is so much to talk here. The Message Bible puts it this way. From the very first day we were there, taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears, saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it. We heard it. Now we're telling you that you can experience it along with us. You see that language, that you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Your joy will double our joy. The Amplified Bible. I'm writing about what existed from the beginning. What we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The one who existed even before the beginning of the world, Christ. And the life, an aspect of his being, was manifested. And we have seen it as an eyewitness. And testify and declare to you the life, the eternal life, who was already existing with the Father and was actually made visible to us, his followers. What we have seen and heard, we also proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship as partners with us. And indeed our fellowship, which is a distinguishing mark of born-again believers, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things to you that our joy in seeing you included may be made complete by having you share in the joy of salvation. What are your thoughts when you read those words? What's going on in your mind? What do you think was going on in, in John's thinking? You see, as a friend of Jesus, with a long-term perspective, he knew certain things. There was certain revelation that was filling him that you and I don't even see when we read the words of these scriptures. You see, he says this, the word of life, which I'll get on to now. He says the word of life was made manifest. The word manifest is the Greek word phaneru. I don't know how to pronounce it. P-H-A-N-E-R-O-O. -O, which means to reveal, to become visible, to become plain, to become clear. The word of life was manifest. The word of life was revealed, became visible, it was made plain, it was made clear. It is the word from which we get the English word phenomenon. Something happened. And I need you to see, John's saying, I need you to understand the something has happened. And the something that has happened is real. He says, which we have seen, which we've looked at. The word seen is a Greek word, horaio, O-A-H-O-R-A-O, -O, which is a very common word simply meaning to see, to catch sight of, which we've seen. That, it's in front of us. Then he says what we've looked at, which is the Greek word, theomai. T-H-E-O-M-A-I, which means to gaze, to behold. It's a, it's a very dramatic word. The idea of a spectacle now seen in full power and wonder. From this we get the root Greek word for the English word theater. A theater is something you go to that's put on that you can look at and think, oh wow, when you go to the theater. We have looked at something and we've seen something. And if you know or understand Greek, in John's wording, he's playing around a bit and he's trying to make two things plain at the same time. My experience of Jesus is both down to earth and it is a mysterious perception. There is something down to earth about my walk with Jesus, but there is also something very mysterious around my perception of the living word, which is Christ. What is he trying to portray to us? I'm going to try and give a very brief explanation and try and get on to something.
What do you think when you think of Jesus? Besides just the name, what do you think when you think of Jesus? See, John's trying to portray something. He's saying this. In John chapter 1 and in 1 John chapter 1, he says, There was that which was from the beginning. It's a two-play on words. From the beginning of our ministry, in other words, from the time Jesus was revealed to be the Son of God. From then on, but go way back to the creation. Go way back to the beginning of all things. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos of God. He understands that God in His triune being began what we understand as creation through the speaking of a word. So one day God just says, let there be light. Bang. Out of His spoken word, light came. When He spoke the worlds into being, he just spoke a word. And you and I know that we're told today by people who study the stars and the planets that our universe, our known galaxies, are busy expanding. New worlds are being created all the time. God spoke a word way back, and it's an irresistible word that keeps on creating. Things keep on happening. When God speaks a word, you've got to understand, there is something that sits in that word. When He spoke to Adam, and he, uh, when, he, when He began to... Uh, ministered to mankind and he began to speak words when he gave his ten commandments and he spoke words when he spoke through the prophets something dramatic happened with the speaking word of god he created mankind by just a spoken word then later on john discovers that that spoken word became flesh and his name is jesus this word mysteriously becomes flesh jesus is suddenly manifest and we begin to understand something. God, through Jesus, holds the world in being. Are you okay with that? Through Him, everything was made. John chapter 1 says, nothing was made that was not made except through Him. Everything has its being in Christ. Jesus holds everything in His hand, including you. Including the beats of your heart, the thoughts of your mind. He holds like this. We live in a 21st century where everything's happening way too quickly. We don't stop to think. We are harassed. Things are happening. It's very rare to find a thinker today. We are responders. We are vegetators. We are gurglers. We just simply re repeat what News 24 says. There's no original thought anymore. We don't stop to think. We are truly in the last days where we are bombarded by stuff that literally 200 years ago they couldn't do. There was no electricity. The middle of the night, midnight was midnight. Now it's just when you go to bed. But in the days before electricity, it was all dark. You just, that's what you did. You know when ESCOM has their things? That was normal. When that happened, you lit your gas, your, your gas or whatever, and you looked at each other. We live in a world today that's harassed, that's mad. We don't stop to think. But there is this God who holds everything in His hand. The fact that you can move and breathe and have your being today, Paul says, is because of Jesus. Whether you're saved or unsaved, He holds everything. And the Bible says, listen now, God takes the universe as a testimony to Himself. That on that last day of judgment, not one person will ever say, I didn't know. He will say, if you had two brain cells together and you looked up, you would see me. Book of Romans says no one is without excuse because we are held together. And as I said, up until 200 years ago, when you were reliant on rain to fall, for plants to come up, for you to eat, for animals to be alive, you were dependent upon a supernatural being. We have literally tried today to manage God out of the system. But there was a time when mankind for generations and centuries was totally reliant upon a supreme being, aware of their consciences in conversation. Today it's gone. It's largely gone. We have paced up ourselves. We're building Babel again. And we're trying to make sure that God's not in the picture. But He is. And the Bible is very clear that Jesus holds the world together. Whether you're saved or unsaved. And that's why on the day of judgment, every man and every woman will be without excuse. And they will stand before him one day. And can you imagine, as I try to portray just now, what it's going to be like on the day of judgment? Have you ever stopped to think and ponder what judgment will be like when the Bible says God will pour his wrath out upon the world? Have you ever thought about it? What do you think God's going to do upon every human being who throughout their lives, when he demonstrated, when he held them together, when he provided for them, when he blessed them, when as a father he tried to draw them to himself, when they put the finger up and said, stuff you to God. What do you think will be like on that day 
when he looks at all those who rejected the sacrifice of his son. Do you think God on that last day is going to look and say, um, look, I'm really sorry, but, uh, you know, your garments aren't white enough. There's not, not a whole lot of space for you here. Or do you think the words of Scripture are going to come true? On that day, they will behold him in his terrible power and glory. And the Bible says unsaved people will ask that the mountains fall upon them and hide them from the glory of God. They would rather have a rock fall upon them than stand before the one. And do you think on that day God's going to be gentle when it says he rises up in his wrath? Just remember that hell was created for Satan and his angels. It was not created for mankind. Heaven was created for mankind. And so every human being who will go to hell, the Bible says, will look upon Satan one day and will look and say, is this him? Is this the being that crumbled nations? And they will look at his smallness and they will look at the bigness of God and they will be filled with a total dread and a total regret that they rejected him. And he will finally look upon humanity in their sin, in their rebellion, in their hatred of him. And I'm telling you, God will rise up in his power, it says, and he will demand righteousness. He will demand his justice. You, for the first time in known history, mankind will see God angry. Really angry. Why? Because it's the moment he judges sin in its fullness. Wherever he finds it. This world will be so judged. The Bible says fire will demolish this world and it will be recreated. God is going to obliterate everything. Now John is penning these words and he knows how the story ends. And he is saying a day will come when every single human being who said, stuff you to God, God will stand up and say, stuff you back. But he will do it in a way that he will rise up and he will say, away from me. But, 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 away from me. Away from me. Humans, sin, etc. Gone. Obliterated. But before that happens, God did the most amazing thing. That spoken word became flesh. And his name is Jesus. And what the father did was he said, you will look to the son. We sang that song first. And that's why some of you, how we look to the son. We stand up. We pay attention. We look at that song. We get ourselves ready and we say, we look to the son. You change your posture in worship. Because the father said, you look to the son. And when you look at him, something's going to happen. The word of life, the logos becoming Zoe, the very word of life, that which, which I'll, I'll explain more next week, but that which emanates from the very being of God, not only is it life, it says it was eternal life. That life, when you look to him, when you begin to see him, when you begin to hear him, when you begin to touch him, the Bible says you are made new. You are made eternal. The Bible says that literally that life comes within you and recreates you. The Bible calls it being born again. And suddenly, the word of life energizes your vision. That's what it means to be a Christian. This is what happens to you. When you come and make a profession of Christ and you confess your sin, you ask Jesus into your life. That's all you do. Something dramatic happens to you. And the Bible says you begin to live eternally. Now you must understand, heaven's not eternal. Heaven is a created place. The earth is not eternal. It's a created place. Only God is eternal. And he says to you and I, you too will live forever. Jesus says, I will give you eternal life. Do you understand the significance of the language that every single thing you see is created except you? You move from a created being to an eternal being. And God begins to say, I will put my life within you. And here's the secret. When you begin to experience real life, the consequence, verse 4 says, will be joy you will truly learn how to live in a place of joy where your joy is not dependent at all upon the things of this world. Now I go back a little bit. And we need to understand that what I'm talking about here, the life of God, we need to understand something needs to happen. We need to come to Him. There is a language of approach. 
God wants to be experienced. Do you know how many times people come and say, I had a word from the Lord, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said. I listen with less than half an ear to those comments. Just want to be honest. I also listen with less than half an ear when a dipstick comes to me and starts to tell me all that God's telling them for me or for the church. Am I being funny? No, I'm not. But I want to tell you this. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes in to divide soul and spirit. If the word of the Lord truly comes to you, the Bible says faith is released. You receive wisdom from heaven. Can I just be crude enough to say, even the biggest idiot in this room, who might be me, but even the biggest idiot in this room is capable of wisdom greater than Solomon's when the Spirit speaks a word to you. Because I've already begun to explain to you that word is eternal. It is made manifest. And when God speaks a word to you and you begin to touch, to taste, to feel, that is the beginning of what it means to fellowship with the Lord. You see, we have many Christians who believe in Christ but don't fellowship at all. And we told you in 1 John chapter 1 that the reason the life was made manifest to us, verse 3, that we've seen and heard and proclaimed to you that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. I will tell you that most Christians live in the shallow waters where they never experience the God they're trying to proclaim to others. That's why I said this is arguably one of the toughest sermons to ever try and preach. Because people have built in blocks. Some people find the content of this preach hard to receive. If so, if you're battling with what I'm saying, ask yourself why. Why is it hard for you to experience the living God? When you got saved and you were forgiven, are you supposed to experience that forgiveness or not? Are you just supposed to accept it by faith or do you experience it? You experience it. I mean, thanks for your answer. Thanks for your enthusiasm this morning. But if you were, if you're a married person in this room and you grieve your spouse, you really upset your spouse and you realize you've messed up and you go to your spouse and you say, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? And your spouse looks at you and says, love, I forgive you. What do you experience? Acceptance, love, gratitude, your experience. Forgiveness is an experience. That's why we look to him and we, we are grateful. Your experience of forgiveness has an effect. So does communion. Communion meaning fellowship. If you are married today, can I say this? Just close your eyes for half a second and say, thank you, God. Because who are you that your spouse should even have a remote interest in you? You see, we look at you and we see the shaved, some of you, version that arrives at church this morning, all halala. When you're married, your spouse sees you when you fart and burp in bed. When you don't keep your promises. When you smell, when you're horrible. Your spouse lives with that and they love you. Thank God. And I'm not only meaning wives to husbands. I'm saying husbands to wives as well. Wives, have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror in the morning? Yeah. When your husband gets over his fright, when he looks over at your side. He loves you. Thank God that he does. It's an experience. So it is with the Father. What are your blockers? Negative beliefs? Lack of faith? A fear of disappointment? The distractions of the love of this world, the deceit of sin, the strength of your flesh. Ask yourselves, what are the blockers? Because actually there's a language in Scripture that we've been invited into. You see, relationship with God is ours for the taking. But things with God won't just happen. The clue lies in the verbs John used. All doing words. Looked at. Heard. Eyes have touched. He's giving you a clue that your walk with Jesus is far more than simply belief and reading a Bible program. It is an engaging with Him who engages with us. The Bible uses the language of ask, seek, knock. When you pray, fast, give. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. It is suggestive of a God who delights to respond 
to our overtures of faith. You see, when the Bible talks about life, come to me that you may have life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The imagery packed into that word, and I'll explain more next week, is literally the eternal life essence and energy that is God. He begins to transfer to you. You literally begin to experience him at a whole new level. And that's why Jesus said, unless you come to me like a little child, you'll never experience. Christmas is coming. Christmas is coming. Christmas has lost its sparkle to me. Now I save from July because all my sons have come with their shopping lists already. All, all three of them. Dad, I want this and I want this and I want this and I want this and I want this. You see, for my kids, there is a magic around Christmas. We're going to put up some Christmas trees and tinsels and all of this stuff, and it's going to look lacquer, and we're going to put some little gifts under the trees. And for my kids, there's a, there's a magic of this. It's like, okay, they don't, okay, can I just help you? They don't really believe in Father Christmas, okay? So I don't have to sit down to my three boys and say, there isn't really a guy with a big beard. They get it. But there's something of the magic. And Jesus said, unless you become like a little child and experience something of the magic of following me, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Because this kingdom is not entered into by your logic. It is experienced. Come to me, Jesus says, and find rest for your souls. Experience. So I want to close, I have to, by simply saying that when John begins his discourse on who Jesus is, he drops us a hint. And he says, that which I've touched, heard of, and seen. God can be touched, heard, and seen. And you will see as I start to unpack it from next week, all of this happens through the fellowship, the koinonia, of being part of the church. That's where I'm going to go with this. But I want to encourage you this morning to say this. The Word became flesh, dwelled among us, and now He dwells within us by His Holy Spirit, and He invites us into the Word of life. He invites us into an experience of God that you will find in worship, in Bible reading, in communion with Him, in fellowship with the saints, you will begin to experience the reality and the pervasiveness of God. You see, God can be experienced. And I'm telling you this morning, there are guys and girls in this room with blockers. You fear because you haven't experienced. But I just want to just say this. Just deflate the balloon quickly. To the degree that you experience human emotion is a degree to which you're simply meant to experience emotion with Him. That's why the psalmist says, declare his praises. God opens up that you can and should experience him the same way as we experience one another. Your Christian life will so change that others will start looking and saying, this is attractive to me. A friend said to me this morning, it's like the beating heart of a drum. Your life is maintained because God constantly acts towards you. The day he stops, you stop. That's why the Bible says it's a day is decided in heaven which will be your last. And until then, he just starts to do this. And all he asks is that you respond to his presence in your life. Stand with me, please.